Welcome, everyone. I'm Lindsay Wickstrom, a professor here at Columbia GSAP. It's a great pleasure to conclude the spring lecture series with a lecture by Dorte Mandrup. Dorte is a proclaimed humanist, someone who works towards the establishment of a more humane, just, compassionate, and democratic society. Her humanism is a philosophical stance that is made legible in her architecture and her process of making architecture, anticipating the consequences of human action on the planet. She graduated from Denmark's Aarhus School of Architecture in 1991, worked and learned from Henning Larsen briefly before founding her office in 1999. Since then, the collaborations and work that we'll see tonight have expanded and diversified in typology, site, and team. But throughout this time, Dorte has remained steadfast in her search for the non-monumental the counter narrative and the crafting of complex experiences. We're lucky to have witnessed her story in a recently released uh, documentary called Another Kind of Knowledge. If you haven't watched it yet, I highly recommend it. In it, she shares her passion for drawing out the embedded intelligence of building materials, describing this process as the richest source of idea generation. In her work, it shows she is able to find an array of possibility in form and material stories from Danish thatched roofs and reparative Ukrainian limestone to Swedish mass timber and Navy seaplane parachutes. Experimentation and research have propelled the work to unique and surprising places, linking architecture to the fragility of deep geological time, interconnected with human stories, heritage, tradition, and culture. Rendering context through making a materiality has guided the practice to where it is today. Dorte has designed many types of buildings, from co-housing to museums, to research centers and schools. She brings a particularly concentrated and playful spirit to placemaking, attentively imagining new forms and motion, play and spontaneity in the spaces. Her exceptional awareness that good everyday architecture has the potential to transform lives for the better is especially potent in the way she makes spaces for children and young people. Dorte has cultivated a practice that relies on the gathering together of many voices. She emphasizes the importance of building a team with many experts and interests and remains very transparent about the way that her office functions. This point of view has enabled the practice to slowly grow to where it is today at around 86 people with more than 48 projects under her belt over the last 23 years, where she is now the title of creative director. Her sensibility for scale, sight, and cultivated appreciation for difference have earned her in her office five UNESCO World Heritage Site projects to date and numerous environmental leadership awards. Among her many distinguished contributions, she has most recently been elected to the architecture section of Academie der Kunst, joining architects Peter Zumtor, Sugar Ruban, and Anne Lacaton, to name only a few. Dorte's work challenges the profession to be more radical in our empathy towards each other and our surroundings. Her work asks us to spend more time listening and making to approach our contemporary condition with new levels of openness and curiosity. So please join me in welcoming Dorte Mandrup. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you so much for inviting me here today. It's wonderful be, to be in New York, and it's just as cold as in Scandinavia for the moment. Um, so I feel at home. Um, is, can you hear me, or should I check this up, or it's okay? Um, <clears throat> um, and thank you so much for the introduction. Very nice. Um, we, uh, we like to talk uh, about what we call irreplaceable places, and it doesn't mean that it has to be uh, unique places, but it has to do with the thought of thinking of a place as something that could be irreplaceable or has a potential to be irreplaceable, and that architecture, in a way, can underline that uh, potential. So um, when we talk about irreplaceable places, it's not always UNESCO sites or, or landscapes. Um, it, it can be anywhere. Uh, but it's much more about uh, trying to create um, the irreplaceable or, or the, 
the place, you could say. Um, we um, are now uh, 85 uh, people in the office. We work very much in teams. Um, and we do believe that uh, architecture should uh, create an emotional and, and sensoric uh, impact. But uh, thinking of uh, trying to solve some of the challenges that we think that architects should be a part of, uh, like trying to um, look into sustainability in a serious way, not just as an, as an add-on. Um, we are also employing quite a lot of experts um, and very technical technically uh, advanced people in the office. So um, we do believe that uh, sustainability is something that we need to uh, gain competence in and uh, it, it, doesn't, um, it doesn't really help to have the good intentions if we don't have the, the knowledge and the um, expertise within the office. So that's what we const constantly trying to, to gain. So uh, today I will invite you to visit four actually very irreplaceable places. Um, three of them are uh, UNESCO sites um, and one is a historic uh, site in, in Berlin, uh, which is, has a great uh, cultural uh, uh, importance. When you talk about the irreplaceable uh, places in the, the UNESCO heritage, um, term, uh, it's not only because of their beauty, of course, but it's also because um, they are important to the global ecosystems, all of them in different ways. Um, and um, one of the places we'll go to is uh, a rock in Greenland, in Arctic Greenland, um, which is placed in the buffer zone between the UNESCO um, protected ice fjord um, and the ice fjord park. Uh, and the town of Iluliset. The others, the next site is um, a peninsula, a rocket uh, peninsula in Norway uh, on the North Atlantic coast. Uh, this is also 300 kilometers north of the uh, Arctic Circle, but it's very different because you have the Gulf Stream running along the Norwegian coast, which makes the climate much warmer um, and not at all like in, uh, in Greenland. And uh, there's the, the Wadden Sea, which is uh, also a UNESCO protected um, site going all the way from Denmark uh, through Germany to, to ne Netherlands. Um, and the UNESCO um, uh, site is, of course, um, mainly the beach area and our um, museum or visitor center is placed um, outside that zone. And the last one, is uh, Anhalter Bahnhof, uh, the site of Anhalter Bahnhof in Berlin, um, which has um, great historic importance. So if we start uh, in the Arctic, uh, in Iluliset, um, as I said, 300 kilometers north of the Arctic Circle, um, on the west coast of uh, Greenland, close to the Disco Bay. Um, and Greenland is the largest uh, island, I think, in the world. It's as large as Europe, if you don't regard uh, Russia um, as part of Europe. Um, and 80% of this is covered by the northern ice cap. So uh, there's 56,000 uh, people living in Greenland, which is not more than a small provincial town um, in Denmark uh, or anywhere else in the world. Uh, and these, um, they're scattered all over. Greenland on the coast, on the east coast, and on the, the, the west coast. So um, these 56,000 inhabitants, uh, they probably um, don't have much impact on uh, environmental um, challenges, um, but it's one of the places, Iluliset is one of the places uh, in the world where you uh, actually see uh, a very visual, visually um, um, present um, uh, climate change. The, the, the ice fjord uh, is 25 miles long um, and is protected by UNESCO because uh, of the uni unique uh, phenomenon uh, created by um, the rigid bottom in the ice fjord close to the, to the Disco Bay. 
that actually makes the icebergs uh, that are carved from the glacier uh, stop, and then you, the whole ice fjord is kind of packed, um, and then they will, uh, um, they will carve again, and, and the icebergs will uh, sail out into the Disco Bay. So um, the Ice Fjord Center is uh, part of a competition that is um, hosted by the, the Greenlandic government together with a, a Danish foundation, um, uh, the Real Dania, which is um, a philanthropic foundation that is um, helping um, cities and uh, cultural her heritage and um, in a way actually putting quite a lot of money into doing different projects um, around Denmark mainly, but also here in Greenland. Um, the, the glacier uh, that, is, that you can see here, um, in here, you, this is actually the, the northern ice cap, the edge of the northern ice cap. This is a, um, a picture in the summertime, actually. Uh, and, and the glacier here um, is one of the most productive uh, glaciers in, in the world. Uh, so it's always been carving icebergs and, uh, and producing uh, uh, ice, you could say. Uh, but what happens here is that um, in the last, last 20 years, um, the glacier edge has been moving backwards um, to, this, to this edge here and it's very, very visible that the ice cap is melting. So, so apart from this being a, an enormously beautiful place, this is also a place where world leaders would go um, to, to, with their own eyes, see that um, climate change is actually happening. So, um, even though the climate is uh, truly, really um, very, very extreme here, uh, it's, and it's very cold in the wintertime, there's snow um, most of the year, actually, the, there's only a window of, of uh, June, July, August, maybe without snow. Otherwise, you have um, you have snow and you have wind and you have uh, extreme uh, temperatures. But um, on the other hand, this place has also been a place where um, where the where the waters are extremely fertile because of the glacier, because of the um, the melting of the glacier that actually brings minerals um, uh, and. Uh, and uh, other things uh, into the water. Um, and then there's a lot of fish and, and the whole food chain is very uh, rich here. So people have been here since um, uh, ancient times, actually. Uh, and you can hardly uh, believe how you survive in this, in this climate without um, a heater. Um, but, they, but they did. And since the 17th uh, century, the, the Scandinavians has been here uh, to hunt uh, whales. Um, and 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 other fish. So uh, this is the the Green, Greenland's uh, second largest uh, town, um, five thousand inhabitants, um, and there's almost as many dogs, four thousand five hundred dogs, because this is the the means of transportation in the in the winter time uh, along uh, snowmobiles. Mo um, there's actually not a lot of road in, in Greenland um, because it doesn't really make sense. Um, and the main occupation here is, is uh, uh, fishing uh, and hunting. Uh, and of course, tourism is a really, really important um, income as well. Um, so the first time uh, we came here, Raldenia and the, and the Greenlandic government uh, had um, a two-faced uh, competition, international competition. Um, and uh, the first time we came here, um, it was a little bit uh, disappointing because I thought that the site was close to, the, was actually overviewing the ice fjord. Um, but uh, since that was uh, uh, in the UNESCO heritage area, that was not possible. So coming to the site, you couldn't see the ice fjord, fjord um, unless you actually went uh, to, the, to the very edge of the site. Uh, and then you could actually see the ice fjord. And this is a summertime picture. And what you see here is constantly changing because it's actually icebergs that are packed. And sometimes the waters are open, sometimes uh, they look like this. So um, part of the, the scheme to us was to, uh, to create a building where you actually had a possibility 
uh, to move through the building um, and to, uh, and this is actually a picture from, uh, from this uh, summer, uh, and you can move through the building uh, by, by cantilevering the building over the edge of the, of the site. Uh, we got the possibility of getting the view past this big rock here um, and actually getting the view of uh, the ice fjord as you move, uh, slowly move through the building uh, and also uh, uh, revealing the dramatic ice fjord uh, for, for the visitors that are not paying, but actually moving uh, across the roof um, and then out into the, into, into the wilderness. So uh, in the Arctic, uh, there's basically no locally sourced building materials. There's no forest, uh, obviously. There's no timber, there's no steel, there's no uh, concrete. Um, so there's no production of building materials of any sort. So another part of the scheme was to create a building that could be um, pre-produced uh, uh, in Denmark and shipped uh, in, um, in the smallest amounts um, of containers to the site. Um, and as you could see, this is a, this is a picture from February. Um, also, the waters are freezing, so you can't bring material uh, unless you do it in the, in the open window of the summertime, which is very short. So part of, um, part of the scheme is very much about how to make a sustainable uh, building on this site uh, and to do it uh, with, the, with the use of the least uh, material and the most sustainable material, of course, also, but also to create a build building where you don't need um, a lot of um, uh, big machines uh, because there's no big machines in this area. There's no, um, the cranes are not all that large. Um, in, a, in a town of 5,000 people, um, you need to work with what you have here, otherwise you need to ship everything, um, which is not um, a great idea, uh, not very sustainable. So, um, it, so, it, so being able to prepare this um, very thoroughly uh, to make sure that we could um, we could ship everything in a in these containers and make sure that we don't, we're not missing anything because otherwise you had to wait um, for nine months uh, to get the next um, shipment up here. So, so we prepared and we spent quite a lot of time doing um, every detail drawing um, over and, and over again, you could say, and test uh, to make sure that when we actually produced this and shipped it, we could also make sure that the building um, could be closed within the summer period of uh, the two three months before the snow came. Um, so the, the, the building workers could work uh, uh, on the interior for the rest of the year. So, th so there was a longer time uh, plan for this, um, uh, for, for the preparement and for the, for the detailed drawings than in, in other projects. So um, another thing that is uh, extremely important here is that you understand uh, how snow is moving around with the wind. Uh, the wind um, is, is very strong here and it's not, uh, since the snow is of course falling, the, the, there's not, uh, it's not that there's an enormous amount of snow, but the snow is moving around uh, with the wind. So um, one of the big mistakes uh, done in the 60s and 70s uh, in Nuuk, um, the main city of, of Greenland, uh, is, is uh, for Danish architects to build, to, to create um, shelter from the wind uh, because that meant that a lot of the buildings were actually um, almost covered in snow uh, in the winter time and you could hardly get into the entrances um, and uh, having a large build, uh, build up of snow is of course very technically very bad for a building. So, so creating a building that was um, placed uh, in the wind uh, so we had the, the least snow buildup, of course, there's still a little bit. Um, with this boomerang shape, we could, um, we could actually manage not only to have a, a little bit of, of snow buildup here and a little bit of snow buildup here. So, um, so in that sense, um, the boomerang was working really well and we tried it in a, in a wind tunnel um, using a potato flour. Uh, to see how it, it reacted. It, um, it's very lucky because most of the wind is coming uh, from this direction it's, and it's quite um, stable. Um, so with the building cantilevering, of course, to, to be able to see the ice fjord, 
but also uh, lifted up on the ground, mainly because we didn't want to um, we didn't want to blast uh, more than necessary because the uh, the, the 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 fauna uh, around here is extremely um, fragile and it takes a long time uh, for it to come back if you uh, are destroying it with the blasting or with um, with machinery. So lifting up the building, um, but that also meant that we could get the uh, melt water from the snow in the summer in the summertime um, away in a natural way into the lake um, down here. So every time we uh, design buildings, I, I think it's a motive that we, we uh, repeat. It's not just to repeat a, a certain motive, but trying to create um, a public uh, collective space uh, or, or in a way giving back um, to the context, a collective place um, that is not uh, privatized and is not um, in a way uh, part of the building. You don't have to pay to get up there. Um, and it's, it's, it's there for, for everybody. So creating the roof um, as part of the path of the UNESCO heritage site, which is also used very much by the local uh, community, we could in a way uh, uh, give back this um, entrance to the UNESCO heritage park, uh, the possibility of, of, of uh, walking up there and viewing for the first time the ice fjord um, and then moving on uh, into nature. So there's a, there's a kind of gateway between uh, civilization and, um, and the wilderness here. So mm, another um, important, I think, emotional thing about uh, the building is that um, the Greenlandic uh, bedrock is the oldest uh, bedrock in the world, and this is where the... Um, Danish um, Greenlandic uh, geologist uh, discovered that the uh, earth was much, much older than we uh, thought uh, by um, investigating into this um, bedrock. Um, and in a way, you could say with, the, with this billion of um, years time span uh, on, this, on the site, we in a way wanted to, to, to pay homage uh, to that by creating the building um, as, a, as something that had a, a temporary uh, character, almost like um, an animal that is um, going back, or a dead animal, or a skeleton, um, and and this fragility of the of the of the wood and the, the timber, um, we think is, is 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 very suitable. Of course, it's not supposed to disappear within a few years, but but the um, expression of the building. Is, um, is, is much more fragile than this um, um, enormously uh, old ground. So uh, in Greenland, there's no uh, real um, building uh, culture that we could refer to since the, um, the uh, indigenous people of Greenland are a nomadic uh, and usually would move from, from a summer uh, hunting place to a winter um, uh, living space. Um, we, in a way, and the, everything you see in Greenland is um, is actually Scandinavian building tradition. It's a wood houses, wood and timber constructions um, that is shipped from Norway and from from Denmark. Um, and I, I think the Greenlandic uh, kind of culture. Um, there's, they're painted very in very bright colors, which is, a, is quite beautiful in this uh, vast uh, nature. But um, by not having a, a building culture to um, refer to in a way, uh, we decided to uh, work much more um, abstract with the, with the building expression um, as part of, the, uh, part of the landscape, or it's more about the, the tools um, about the kayaks or about the, the lightweight constructions um, that you have in this um, area, the kayak, uh, the tent. Um, and as you see here, um, the, the, the ground is very, this is a summer, summer picture, and of course it's just right after the building site is closed and the building is, is opened. Um, but the, the, in a way, the, the whole construction, the colors and the, and the and the, the cladding uh, and, the, and the colors of the uh, surroundings are in a way merging. 
So by uh, shaping this boomerang, also we're creating an, a more intimate space on the interior of the building um, and um, on the exterior, uh, you have this kind of thrusting uh, building, which is reflected in the, in the, in the pond or the small lake in front. Um, but, cr but creating this gateway um, between uh, the town and the park, um, inviting people up to, to walk on the roof, uh, and it's very, very much in use. Actually, uh, I'm proud to say that people get um, married on, on this roof, uh, and, and uh, so it's in a way, mm, to me, quite touching uh, that the, the, the local community has, has really um, taken the building into, um, in, into their daily life, you could say. So when you move up to the roof, you see uh, the ice fjord for the first time, actually. Um, and as you could see, this is a winter picture. Uh, it's really much in use. You can, you, the, the, the snow is quite revealing. Um, lots of people um, on, um, on skis and, and walking and actually even, um, I think I saw some bikes uh, this summer uh, also um, biking across it. So, so you, you can start your hike um, from the roof. Um, I'm mo moving directly on to the, to the rocks. And uh, uh, when you enter into the building, part of the building is actually an open construction and the idea is that you can find uh, shelter from the wind in the summertime um, and uh, for the cold in the wintertime, uh, but that you have this possibility of finding shelter from both the eastern and the western uh, winds. So half of the building is covered, uh, is covered space. Um, so when you move into the building, you enter into this um, quite closed um, rock, which is almost like a, a cave, you could say. And, and this is where you um, usually you will, um, you will take off your shoes because you, you have um, quite heavy shoes when you walk out in the snow. Also in the summertime, um, you would have hiking boots on. And so, um, so you take off your shoes um, and your... And, and your um, winter clothes here, and then you move into the to the building. Um, to the this is the cafe area and the reception. Everything is kind of um, designed um, so one person can uh, service the building also in the winter time where there's not as a, a lot of tourists, um, and in the summertime it can expand um, and you can have more people uh, working here. So the exhibition is about the importance of ice. Um, and Greenlandic uh, culture, um, and it's it's kind of an overlap of very advanced um, technical uh, means uh, like the VR uh, film here and and old-fashioned books, and actually the books are very very popular. Um, I guess they're almost exotic now, um, and and then there's um, there's a cinema inside one of the rocks that we we placed on the, on the surface. So they're kind of in very enclosed places and very open um, spaces here. Um, and here you see, um, moving through the building, uh, you, you slowly get a, a view of the, of the ice field. Um, in, in the center, there's a, the, the centerpiece here um, is actually an ice core. Uh, and I think it's the first time an ice core has been exhibited. Uh, usually there will be um, at universities uh, of, uh, in Copenhagen, there's a, there's a big um, storage of ice cores. This is where you can actually read uh, things going on in the globe. You, you, you can see the Industrial Re Revolution um, and other um, big events happening uh, around the globe in these uh, ice cores. It's quite, uh, quite exciting, actually. And here's... Um, uh, the, the small pieces here, of course, representing different um, eras. And the exhibition architect uh, who we've been working with uh, several times has um, worked with these um, glass uh, cast of uh, ice blocks uh, from, the, from the ice fjord um, and using them as uh, exhibition uh, mantras. And here the view of the, um, of the beautiful area. As you can see, it's really, um, in the wintertime, uh, it's, it's extremely frozen. 
um, this area. And in a way, we wanted this building to also uh, create shelter, almost like a, a, a beacon um, when, you, when you come from a walk and there's actually people, um, also tourists, coming here uh, during the winter time. So, so having this um, shelter in this vast uh, area, also having it uh, have in, this, in the winter time, um, as a almost like a light tower or a, a horizontal light tower, you could say. You know, what you see here is, of course, um, the snowmobiles um, coming back to the to the town. Um, and uh, and in a way, uh, again, being, I think, when you are in the Arctic, it's it's the only place I've discovered uh, where you really feel that if you walk in the wrong direction. Uh, you might be dead, uh, and uh, and it's um, I mean coming from Denmark, which is everything is cultivated and um, and nothing is dangerous. Uh, this is um, is both very exciting but also very uh, scary. Uh, so in a way, uh, looking at this building as as the sh as the shelter in the in this um, enormous nature, and of course the winter is. Um, it's dark, uh, the 30th of November, uh, you, the sun goes down and you won't see it again until um, January. Uh, but then there are other amazing phenomena uh, that is worthwhile seeing. So more and more tourists um, are, are here and the, the building is actually open. Um, and this is not photoshopped, this is how it is. Uh, and of course it's much more amazing being there because this moves constant, constantly on the sky. Um, changing all the time. It's actually um, amazing. But the sun comes back um, on the 12th of January, uh, 12 o'clock, um, and then the, the local community actually meets and also did before the building. They were meeting here to celebrate um, the rise of the sun um, that actually uh, uh, rises for 40 minutes and then it goes down again. Um, <laughs> But then, of course, in the summertime, it never goes down, which is uh, absolutely uh, magic. Um, and then, uh, so sitting on the roof or being on the roof um, to, to celebrate this, uh, and the, the building is kind of becoming part of this celebration, uh, which we're very uh, proud of. Um, and this is what you see when you, uh, you take a hike uh, into the area moving over. This is, in, this is actually from February. Um, yes. So another Arctic place, uh, um, a building that we still haven't um, executed. Uh, executed? It's a wrong word, isn't it? Oh. Anyway, um, we haven't built it yet, but we under it's under um, it's on the drawing board. Uh, we're doing the, the starting up with the with the detailing. Uh, it's uh, Andoya in uh, in Norway uh, on the Norwegian west coast, also the Arctic. Um, but with a much uh, warmer uh, climate. The, the reason uh, this was also an international um, competition that we uh, won, and uh, it's a, this is a picture of the, of, the, of the ocean bottom, the sea bottom here, um, and what you see here is the, the small islands, uh, Andoya and Lofoten further down south. Um, and the reason why uh, there is a lot of whales to be seen here is because of this uh, ocean bottom, because the big tooth whales need a lot of depth, because they need, um, uh, amongst other uh, other things, they need to feed on big uh, octopuses that are um, that are living in the bottom of uh, of these um, valleys. You can almost call them, um, and you have uh, almost all kinds of whales coming by here because they follow the the bottom of the sea to. Um, to actually navigate, um, and uh, the males are traveling uh, from the, the, the north of the Arctic uh, Sea uh, all the way to the Caribbean um, to mate, uh, and then they go back again. And the most amazing thing is that they navigate um, along these uh, edges of the, of the valleys, but also it's a cultural thing, so they kind of learn from each other. Um, how to, 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 to actually travel that uh, long way. So, so Andoya is a, is a place where a, a, a large amount of uh, scientists, but also tourists, come to 
uh, take a boat because very close to the coast, uh, you can actually see the whales um, during their migration. Uh, there are killer whales and sperm whales um, and all uh, kinds of other whales here. So the idea here is to uh, build a whale um, visitor center for, not for whales, but a, a visitor center that is, uh, that is telling the story about the whales culturally um, and of course also from the natural science uh, 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 part. Um, and um, amongst other things, um, this small island uh, had a military base that was closed up and uh, they are also in desperate need, uh, in desperate need of, of um, employment uh, here. So, so part of this uh, idea is also to create uh, tourism uh, or to in, enhance, enhance and underline the tourism in the area. So the, the building is initiated by, the, by a local uh, group of biologists and um, um, local um, entrepreneurs, you could say, and then they, um, they actually got the state to finance um, most of this uh, building. <clears throat> uh, so this is the, the, the building site here. And as you can see, it's really quite small. Uh, and the program was 6,000 uh, square meters, so almost covering the whole um, area. And, and it was a, an area where also the local um, population uh, would use for walks and, and um, fishing and so forth. So the uh, program said that the edge of the, um, of the island should be uh, accessible uh, uh, for the public, um, but otherwise there was no kind of limits to what we could do. So um, the idea uh, was in a way to create, um, to look at the, when you look at the, the, the crust of the earth and the ocean bottom there, uh, they are of course connected, they're all part of the same surface. So uh, the idea was to underline that or to, um, by, by looking at the site as, um, uh, in a way, as a, an earth crust that you could cut, you could incise into, or you could, you could cut into, um, and by doing that, you could create the building underneath um, the, the crust of the earth. Um, <clears throat> and by doing that, we could also um, create a new uh, public uh, landscape or, or plaza uh, where you could um, view uh, the ocean. You can't actually see whales from here, uh, but at least you could you could uh, look at the ocean from here and when, by rising up this hill, you get a much uh, better view. And then working with the uh, surface of the island uh, in a way, so it created the floor of the, of the building. And by doing that, we don't have a base of the building. Uh, everything is in a way following the topography of the, of the surface. So, um, so you only see the shell. Um, and not a big uh, base, uh, and, and uh, you, you, you get a, a very close uh, relationship to the, to the water on the outside here. And by working with the um, curved glass, uh, we also get a, a quite um, robust uh, construction because the wind uh, is quite harsh here also, um, and, and the curvature of the glass is helping us with the, with the wind pressure. Um, and also creating, uh, in a way, a, 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 a surreal view of the, uh, of the exterior. Um, the interior exhibition is a, is, is a mixture of art uh, pieces, of, uh, of very sort of haptic uh, objects uh, in one, on one hand, and then, of course, also working with um, a different uh, advanced uh, media inside the exhibition here. So being this close to the ocean and the very harsh saline um, atmosphere, uh, we need to use concrete as, as part of the uh, building. Actually, we don't like to use concrete very much anymore um, because it's so unsustainable. Um, but we are working uh, on minimizing the amount of concrete here. Um, and then we use the, nat the natural stone from the area uh, to, uh, as a cladding of the, of the building. 
And of course, making the roof uh, publicly uh, accessible, we, we, we are in a way giving back land uh, that was taken to build the building. Um, and hopefully it will be kind of um, uh, an important place uh, for the local community. Now, um, now we're moving down, down south uh, to Denmark. Um, and this is uh, in Ribe, Denmark, which is kind of um, uh, on the edge, you could say. It's, it's, a, it's a very uh, rural uh, area. And it's um, uh, along the, the, the Wadden Sea. Um, and this, uh, the Wadden Sea is actually starting a little further north and goes all the way uh, down to, to Netherlands, um, as I explained before. Um, and we've been lucky enough to create a tr uh, trilogy, you could say, almost of Wadden Sea centers. Uh, we are, are creating um, a, a seal um, center in, in um, Laos or in, um, in Netherlands on the, on the, on the Dutch coast. Um, and we are creating um, a trilateral um, conference center for the Wadden Sea um, collaboration in, uh, in Germany in a, in an, um, on top of an old bunker from a submarine uh, harbor from the Second World War. But uh, I'm, I'll tell you, tell you about that another time. Uh, this is uh, Ribe, Denmark. And the, the Wadden Sea uh, looks a little boring here. It's just a, an open uh, surface. Um, but the reason why the Wadden Sea is UNESCO uh, protected is because all the migrating birds that are, that are coming from the tundra in the north and from, from Canada going uh, migrating all the way uh, to Africa are coming past this place because it's so uh, fertile. Uh, there's so much food here. Um, and uh, so it has really a, 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 a global um, importance um, in, in the ecosystem. So uh, birds and seals um, uh, and, and different other animals are dependent on this uh, place. And the reason uh, why um, it is so fertile is because of the, the, the tide and the very, very shallow sea bottom. So, so you will have land for many kilometers uh, when the tide is low um, and it becomes water when the tide is high um, and making um, the sea bottom uh, when it's dry um, full of food, you could say, for these birds. And this is uh, uh, Darling Magic, it's called, uh, or we call it Dark Sun. Um, and it's, um, it's the formation in the sky that these birds make when, they, when there's a predator um, close by and they will, in a way, try to confuse the predator uh, by making these, um, when they, they, they fly very close by each other. So this is a phenomenon uh, a lot of tourists are coming to see. Um, and it's in the spring and the fall, mainly where the migrating birds are here. Um, and so there was a small center here um, that was um, focused on the migrating birds um, and they wanted uh, to extend the center and they got this uh, foundation um, that are uh, Real Dania, which also uh, financed the, the ice Road center to finance a, a competition um, and uh, that we were lucky to win. So, um, so there's Something uh, else about this area is that it's it's old Viking uh, area when they were not um, raping and fighting and going to UK, um, they, they would actually have farms, uh, so they could also be quite peaceful um, times. And um, this is an old, it's not an old Viking, it's a reconstruction of a Viking longhouse. Uh, so uh, where you used the thatched uh, roof and, and um, rammed earth uh, construction and of course the, the timber um, as part of the construction. And, and so uh, this is the, the reeds used for the, for the roofs and it's actually grown quite close by and it's, a, it's of quite high quality. You can also buy um, reeds uh, around Europe, but this is, uh, first of all, it's high quality. Secondly, if you want it to be sustainable, it has to be harvested quite uh, close by. So. Um, so you could say this is the existing center that we needed to extend. Um, and the extension was t um, three times as big as the existing uh, part, but still we had to integrate the existing uh, buildings into the new center, which is quite difficult. This is a building from the 90s, doesn't really relate 
um, to the area, not to the building uh, heritage, you could say, in the area, or to, um, in a way, to the way you would make a farmhouse. It looks like a farmhouse, but it doesn't really uh, relate very much to how the existing farmhouses look like, with the very wrong proportions and, and so forth. Um, on, the ha on the other hand, um, by reusing the existing buildings as much as possible, we could also um, make it as sustainable as possible uh, by not uh, tearing down and, and, um, and so forth. So um, the idea, this is the existing uh, buildings, the idea was to integrate the existing buildings into the new buildings um, in, uh, in a way, in a embracing way you could almost say with the, with the new buildings on the outside um, of the existing buildings um, but but then we had to have the entrance actually in the gable here because we're using of toilets and kitchen and um, and and part of the uh, old building without having to change very much uh, in a way uh, we, we were forced to to make the entrance into this part of the building um, and then there's a new education building here, um, the new exhibitions integrated into the old exhibitions, <coughs> and a new boathouse <coughs> down here. So as the Vikings uh, did, we, um, we wanted to, to try to, to use the, the, the nearby harvested uh, reeds um, as much as possible. Um, and we, tr we really wanted to experiment with the reeds as a cladding not only on the on the roof but also on the facades um, and and on the overhang uh, so um, we studied some of the dutch uh, buildings that actually had uh, thatched uh, material on the on the facades uh, but nobody had done the overhang before so so we we worked with this uh, in a way almost like um, a surface uh, or a volume of clay um, and, and worked with these carts into the building, uh, both to, to make the wind, uh, which is very uh, strong here because it's, it's absolutely horizontal, um, to, to make shelter from the wind and make the wind actually come over the house um, to create shelter in the, in the center of the uh, courtyards, uh, but also to um, work with the entrance and to, to, uh, to enhance uh, that quite strange placement of the of the entrance, so it became um, natural. So the 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 material and and the and the site in a way the colors and the uh, materiality of the um, of the area in, in a way patinates um, uh, together. You could say that. So the building is in a way uh, growing up from the the very horizontal. Uh, surface. The, the reed works very, really well in this uh, very saline climate uh, because it's impregnated by the salt. Um, it's also uh, helping the reeds to, to, to be fireproofed. Um, so we use also salt as a um, fry, fire protection. Um, and um, if, if this was actually placed in a forest, it wouldn't work as well because the then the, the, the reeds will um, deteriorate much, much quicker. So uh, lots of wind and lots of salt in the air, um, then it's really good for the, for the cladding here. So, so in a way, inserting these diagonal cuts um, to underline um, the entrance, um, uh, awkwardly placed in the end of the building, um, and, uh, and work with these diagonal lines all together to, to make this um, grow from the landscape instead of being in contrast uh, to the landscape. Um, and uh, yeah, and then of course also working very much with the uh, connection between ex interior and exterior. A lot of exhibition buildings are these kind of closed boxes uh, where you create your own um, uh, atmosphere inside, as, but we really wanted this to be connected to the exterior, so we worked with different um, connections and different ways of looking at the sky or looking at the um, inframed part of the, of the landscape here. Um, the existing building, which was, uh, as you, you probably could remember, white and with the whitewashed and with a, with a red uh, tile uh, roof, 
we we were cladding in uh, Rupinia, which is a, a European uh, sort of Central European, uh, quite sustainable um, timber or wood, uh, because it's extremely oily um, and it actually works um, like teak. Uh, but you could actually harvest it in um, in Poland and other places. So. This, these uh, um, trees are quite small and very skinny, so and they also are moving a lot. So you can only work with them in, in, in quite small pieces; otherwise, they will bend and um, and so forth. But this is um, uh, the cladding is non-treated, and uh, you can you can you can actually work with this without treating it um, at all. It goes grey um, after some years. So the interior. Um, is abstract, uh, and uh, we try to, in a way, move back uh, so the exhibition becomes more important than the materiality of the of the building here. Um, and this is the the last um, part of the exhibition. It's called the uh, departure, and it's a it's a it's an art piece, um, which is a, a digital art piece um, trying to. Um, tell the story about the um, departing birds. So, Berlin, Germany, uh, which is the only kind of city site for this uh, lecture. Um, the Anhaler Bahnhof, I don't know how much, um, I mean, now we're quite far away from Europe, but Anhaler Bahnhof was, um, has a, a, for Europeans uh, and especially for Germans, really heavy layers of um, emotion. Um, in the beginning, uh, Anhalter Bahnhof was the largest train station um, in Europe. And this is where people were coming from, mainly from the south, uh, and arriving um, in Berlin. Um, and a lot of liberals, a lot of uh, scientists, a lot of artists uh, coming to Berlin during the Weimar Republic, um, which was kind of, a, it was kind of a center um, for um, for art and the science um, in the in the 20s, um, so they came through um, uh, Anhalter Bahnhof. Um, it was um, later uh, during after um, Hitler took power. It was also a backdrop uh, for a lot of his uh, propaganda, uh, receiving um, receiving people here at uh, at Anhalter Bahnhof and also. Um, very uh, tragically, this is where a lot of the transportation to uh, to camps uh, went from. Uh, so, so in a way, it, it's it has both been uh, good memories and certainly um, very very tragic memories around Anhalter Bahnhof. Then, um, when the war uh, when the war uh, came uh, into Berlin, uh, Anhalter Bahnhof lost its uh, importance totally. It was bombed. Uh, during the war, but then there was still uh, ruins left, and there were also trains com uh, coming and going from Anhalter Bahnhof until the the war, um, which meant that the um, tracks were going into East uh, Berlin, and in that sense, coming from West, um, it it was kind of meaningless, and it was uh, blasted uh, in the 60s. Um, so not uh, not during the war; it was bombed during the war, but but the remains were actually blasted. Um, during the 60s. Uh, and, and one of the things that's, um, yeah, one of the things is that there's only one fragment left of the Anhalter Bahnhof on the site, uh, which was actually saved by um, some, uh, a local architect uh, that insisted that the, there had to be remains, uh, some, something uh, that could uh, bear witness in a way to to all um, the tragic and um, stuff that had happened um, at Anhalter Bahnhof. So there's a small fragment left, um, and there's um, an organization, a foundation, that uh, private uh, organization that is um, raising money to build a, a museum for exile here because um, the, the meaning of being in exile has not really been explored um, in exhibitions it's mainly the, the, the Holocaust that has um, been focused on, but the meaning of being in exile uh, and all the people that went into exile from uh, Anhalter Bahnhof um, in 1933 uh, or very fast had to go into to exile. So 
This um, museum, uh, which is also an international competition, is about um, exile and with a focus on exile after 33. And so I'm going to, to play a short video now, which is um, um, one of the um, videos that will be in the exhibition. Uh, it's, it's a witness that are still survived, um, that went into exile um, uh, around uh, 33. So. Wann beginnt das Exil? Ähm, nicht gleich. Also in meinem Alter, 17 Jahre oder so, ist das ja ganz schön aufregend, in die Fremde zu dürfen. Doch sehr bald kommt das Gefühl auf, ich kann ja eigentlich nicht mehr zurück. Man hat sich eingeredet die ganze Zeit, ich bin im Ausland, aber ich kann ja immer heim. Und auf einmal merkt man, weiß man, dieses Heim wird es nicht mehr geben. Und das stimmt ja auch. Man kommt ja nicht zurück. Man kann ja nicht zurück. Weil man sich selber verändert hat und weil die Heimat sich verändert hat. Heimatlosigkeit, Verbindungslosigkeit, äh, das Gefühl, im, im leeren Raum zu schweben, nirgendwo hinzugehören. Äh, und es bedeutet damit den Verlust der Identität dass man nicht mehr weiß, wer man eigentlich ist äh, und wozu man da ist. Eigentlich ein Zustand, in dem man lebenslang leidet. Ja? Dass man seinen eigenen Gefühlen, auch wenn sie nachher kommen, nicht zu einem Land, aber zu einem Menschen, dass man seinen Gefühlen nicht traut, weil man sich sagt, ja, was sagt man sich? Irgendwie unbewusst sagt man sich, ein Heimatloser hat kein Recht, etwas zu fühlen kein Recht auf seinen eigenen Gefühlen zu bestehen. Das sind erfundene, fiktionale Gefühle. Die echten Gefühle hat man nur in der Heimat gehabt. Nur dort konnte man etwas fühlen. Das ist ein, ein furchtbarer Zustand für einen jungen Menschen, dass man sich selber so misstraut und dass man nicht mehr das Gefühl hat man selber sein zu dürfen. Darauf läuft es am Ende hinaus. So, um, going into exile um, in, in a way means floating in, in the air uh, without identity and without uh, language, without uh, culture. In a way leaving everything uh, behind but also moving into um, absolute um, uncertainty. So, I mean, you often think of exiled people as survivors and not as victims, but, um, but, to, but to, to be forced into exile um, is a certain um, state of mind, you could say, that, act that never actually changes and in a way is a, um, a, can be very, very um, tragic. Um, so, um, when you could say that, when, the, when you look at this, uh, when you look at the site, uh, and you have this, uh, this is only part of the uh, former entrance portico that you have left. So the the extension or the in, enormous extent of the of the former building uh, is no longer there, and in a way, um, you could say that the scale of what was there. Uh, is is uh, actually not um, present, uh, but still the 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 the, the fragment has, um, in a way, uh, been bearing witness uh, to uh, so much, uh, and and it's um, so in a way what we wanted to do. This is when you go through the fragment, and you only see a sports field, um, and a new uh, kind of. Um, Public building down here, uh, but this this whole area was one big uh, uh, train station. Um, but so what we wanted to do was to, uh, in a way, pay respect to that small fragment, uh, uh, but not to uh, to rebuild or not to build um, close to this um, to this building. Some of the other contestants uh, were 
working with the with the with the scale of the former building and actually working uh, with the fragment as part of the new building. Um, and we wanted to also represent the span of time, you could say, of this um, that has um, emerged since everything happened around Anhalter Bahnhof and then the new building here. So, so creating, uh, in a way, a plaza of, um, of remembrance uh, between the uh, existing fragment and the new building was important to us. Um, at, since you cannot, uh, in a way, you can't repair, you can't rebuild um, history. So, so mainly the, the new building is a backdrop to the, um, to the fragment uh, to, uh, to underline the, the fragment and to make a new um, abstraction uh, behind it. So the, the idea is that you have the, the former uh, entrance building here. This is the, the, what's left, uh, the, this small portico. Um, and so what we did was to work with the geometry. So uh, the, the backdrop uh, itself were um, placed exactly where the uh, entrance stairs to the, to the tracks, which were on the first floor of the building. So, so in a way, um, entering into the building and moving up uh, into, the, into the tracks uh, has been part of the movement uh, that we also wanted to recreate. So, so moving upwards without be, uh, knowing where you, um, w what was going to happen in the future, uh, you can you can you can imagine how that would have been here. Um, so, the, the the former monumental staircase here is where the entrance uh, of the new building starts. Um, then the site uh, there's a an U-Bahn uh, subway here, uh, and the site is actually smaller than the former um, uh, train station was. Uh, and you have, as you can see, a lot of foundations uh, underneath uh, the building here that uh, might be still uh, present. We actually don't know yet. But, <clears throat> but, but by creating this, this empty space, you, you also make a, a, a kind of space of reflection between, you can enter also through the portico, but you can enter along the, the building here. Um, and then we created a, a plaza, which is uh, slightly curved. So you move uh, upwards and a little bit uh, uncertain uh, on your feet uh, into, the, into the building. Um, and uh, as, you can, as you can see, uh, maybe you can see it slightly here, uh, the, the whole plaza moves from here and upwards uh, to the first, um, to, the, to the stairs to the exhibition here. So the, the large vault uh, of, the, of the portico, but also of the existing uh, or the former um, train station, we, uh, in a way, interpret here in, in a building that, that is not representing the former building, but in a way representing the um, old buildings of transit. You could say the, 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 the train station, the bus station, the... Um, any, any kind of place uh, of transit. So making this really, really large span and making a building that has no kind of rest, um, uh, this open, um, large space. So as you see here, you have the, the building moving upwards. And by doing that, we, um, you can actually create a movement where you don't see the horizon until you, you get up uh, here and you can move up to the exhibitions here. Um, and then there's a, there's actually a, a, um, a space down here, which is not part of the museum, but is, uh, is part of the football field here, and also part of the um, exhibition that tells about uh, uh, Anhal Labanov. Uh, and so in a way, making this uh, choreography inside the building where you bring upwards and you, you have no possibility of um, um, understanding what will meet you and having these interlocking um, quite sort of intricate spaces uh, so when you move around you have um, a feeling of being uh, interfered you could say. And so the facade is uh, um, in many ways uh, referring of course to the, the former 
building, but in, an, in a new modern way uh, with an open uh, filter uh, between the interior and the exterior uh, in brick. Uh, and then you have the, the, the very large span inside here um, moving on this soft, softly curved floor. So in a way, uh, exhibitions about uh, exile has never been more relevant, you could say. Um, there's, there's never been more people on the move uh, around the world. Uh, of course, Ukraine uh, is one of them, but uh, Syria and, 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 and so many other uh, people that are uh, forced into exile. So in a way, you could say that you, you could hope that this exhibition and this building um, will help uh, to create an understanding of what it actually means to uh, be forced um, into exile by, uh, from whatever reason. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dorte. Um, it was an incredible four projects. I think um, I wasn't sure what you would share with us this evening, so it was amazing to see them. Uh, I think that there's such richness in the way that you see the site. I think that was evident in the way that you told the stories and kind of unfolded all of the views of a place and perspectives that are existing in a place, um, going way back in time, and then also reaching into the future. You spoke a lot about um, accessing old knowledge and traditional knowledge and bringing that into a contemporary space. And one, one kind of um, touching moment, I think, when you're really finding a lot of formal um, opportunities with the material stories that are present or not present in the case of Greenland, um, I was curious to hear a little bit more about your process for unfolding or un, un, or learning um, about those kinds of constraints. Um, I noticed also that a lot of the projects had photography and, and images that felt like things were very tangible and real and the materiality was very present. You could tell that it had weight um, already in the, in the presentation, whether it was built or unbuilt. And I was kind of curious to know, how do you design the process for um, considering these architectural options or experiences and honing in on really the right story when it comes to these kind of physical constraints of a project? Well, I think um, um, we have a quite slow process. Um, and I think uh, this is why competitions is, is, is never um, a good uh, commercial thing to do because we spend quite a lot of time um, in a way to try to um, excavate uh, a site to, to find something that we could use to bring the project f uh, on, you could say. So, so we, um, we would usually um, collect a lot of information. Uh, we will also try to work with experts uh, with, with the Iluli set, we worked with the uh, Mini Grosing, the geologist, uh, with, with, the, with the whale. We worked with a, a biologist that was specialized in migrating uh, whales. And, and, and in a way, you know, you try to find knowledge um, around a project and a program uh, that, that can, in a way, give more depth to the, to the, to the building, to the form, to the materiality. I, I think... Um, I, I find it really, really difficult just to create shape kind of out of nothing because there's no, uh, you know, you need to create a frame um, that can in a way direct you. Um, so I, I, but we spent a lot of time on collecting uh, and a lot of the information we, we, we get from a site or a history or uh, whatever uh, is maybe not useful. Uh, so it's kind of, um, um, yeah, it's not a it's not a, an effective uh, way of working, I would say. But um, then, of course, there's a lot of intuitive um, choices to be made. But then, what we would do would also try to create, um, you know, a challenge that we need to to solve. And then we we would test the different uh, concepts 
up against these set of uh, challenges, you could say. So, um, so it's kind of a slow moving inwards um, from lots of information to uh, to concepts. And I we try uh, I try very much also with the sort of younger architects in the office to to um, prevent that there is a there's kind of a certain shape or form or object uh, created before we know what we really f will find is important. Um, so, so we, we usually we say don't fall in love uh, until you know, you know who you're gonna marry or you know. <laughs> so it's a, um, it's it's kind of a yeah it's kind of a time consuming uh, process. Mm -hmm. And it seems like you've spent a great deal of time navigating how to arrive at those particular projects throughout your practice um, and working with clients who are interested in that process. I think instead of effective, maybe efficient is the word that we yeah. don't like. Yeah, um, yeah. 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 <laughs> efficiency yeah. begets yeah. very yeah. little. Um, I, I think this idea of working with young people too is really inspiring and, and interesting, um, especially when, it, when you're engaging both the past and the future. You're reaching back and also trying to anticipate what the future is kind of bringing or hosting and those kind of questions of the next 20, 50, 100 years, um, you know, especially in the case of exile and the last kind of slide that you shared, um, you know, is there a kind of, is there a moment where you felt really surprised by the outcome through this kind of consensus building on the team where the possibly new knowledge that's arising or coming out of certain contemporary events is driving a project in a certain direction that you might not have anticipated? Um, well, I think uh, with the Illuniset uh, project, I think what we expected was, um, or we feared, you could say, is that you know you have a, you have a, um, uh, um, you have a, a foundation uh, from Denmark, uh, in a way, paying a lot of money to build a building in Greenland. And what we, um, yeah, our worst fear was that the building would not be part of the local community, or they, they so I think um, we tried a lot to um, also to discuss this with the with the client. You know that we need to to we need to have this roof. And, you know, because that was the first part of, you know, cutting budget would be, would, you know, maybe we don't need that roof because it's not, you know, it's not a necessity. Um, and so we've been, we were fighting a lot f to keep this roof. And, 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 and I am actually surprised that um, it is so much part of daily life. And uh, from the first day, people just, you know, when I was there and last time I was there in October, um, you know, people come you know, from work and they would go for a walk and they just immediately just went up on the roof as part of the, the which was a natural part of their walk. And that was, I didn't anticipate that. I didn't expect it to be so, so naturally kind of um, em, embraced by uh, the local uh, community. So I, I hoped for it, but I didn't uh, think it would happen maybe. So yeah. Yeah. Happy yeah. Sense. Um, I'll, I'll might ask one more question, but I would also invite any questions from the audience. Um, I think we have a mic going around, so please raise your hand and interrupt me. Um, I could probably stay up here <laughs> for a while. I, uh, I'm curious you know, um, to hear a little bit of what you think about sustainability. I think in the beginning you mentioned a sentence about it not being a kind of add-on and it is to me similar to the argument of the public roof where you're trying to describe these intangible values that are, have time and people and qualities that are difficult to measure and difficult to draw and I also was thinking is this why you present a lot of photography is it feels the most tangible mm -hmm. how do you find this kind of um, this kind of ephemerality being projected or I don't want um, or shared or taught in, in these kinds of, this difficult time that mm, we live in? Mm. I, it, I guess, I mean, to me, um, um, I think sustainability, I mean, 
the climate uh, challenge or, um, is so urgent now. So in a way, it should be shaping architecture much more than it is actually shaping architecture because sustainability is, it, it's, it's in a way, um, I mean, there are materials you can't use, I think, um, which is not sort of morally, morally sustainable. I mean, there's there's things you I don't think you can do anymore, even though it's aesthetically pleasing um, or a wonderful material. You know, there, there, there's I think there's so many things um, that you have to take very very seriously now. So there are um, there are just things you can't do anymore. And um, no matter how much I would love to build an in situ concrete building somewhere, it's just not. Possible, and I think that kind of um, understanding um, is, is is far too slow in a way. There's a, there's a there's a there's a um, will around uh, globally that we should be sustainable, but I mean it's just not uh, f it's not far enough. It's it's really um, it has to move so much faster, mm -hmm. and there's just things we can't do anymore, um, and you know. But I, I'm, I'm, in that sense, I'm really worried. Um, um, I think that, that, like you say, times are very worrying for the moment, and um, climate change is one of them. Mm. There's also kind of a, a political instability, in a way, uh, emerging that I think is a very uh, worrying. Yeah. 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 And you also teach. Do you? Does this conversation come up often with students? Yeah, well, I teach in uh, in Switzerland and um, in Mendrisio, and um, it seems like it, concrete is the only material that they know, um, and uh, and I think there's there's uh, and it, it, I understand that in a way in Scandinavia uh, because since the oil crisis there's um, there's been kind of um, a, um, quite. Uh, Hard work to kind of bring uh, energy consumption down uh, in the in the use of buildings, but I think the 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 imprint of uh, CO two when you actually uh, built uh, hasn't been very uh, important, uh, but it is now. And I think uh, when you go to Switzerland, it's actually um, it's 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 actually hasn't arrived yet. Right? Mm -hmm. So I'm trying. You're going. So, <laughs> You're trying. <laughs> Are there any questions from folks? I'm sure it would be, yeah, great. Well, I have a dumb question that we have discussed before. So no questions are dumb. <laughs> <laughs> before the lecture starts. Um, is the Varden Sea Visitor Center, the roof of Varden Sea Visitor Center, is all consists of reed or there is a structural base underneath? Uh, yes, I, uh, because of fire risks, uh, you need to have um, an under roof, uh, which is a, 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 a roof that will not protect the reed from fire, but um, ensure that you don't, don't get oxygen mm. in, right? Because the, the, when reeds are, are burning, it's mainly because there's a possibility of having oxygen. Uh, otherwise, it's actually much less uh, fire dangerous than you should think. Um, so there's a there's a roof underneath to protect the building from fire. But in in a traditional construction of reeds, you wouldn't have you would only have a a, a wood construction, an open wood construction um, allowing air uh, in uh, underneath, which also keeps the reeds uh, healthy. Um, but you need a, an under roof. Um, Especially for a public building, otherwise it's too risky. Mm. Is that a, another a good answer or an answer? <laughs> That's a great question. But but I can I, but with the Warden Sea Center, there was the existing buildings was um, actually made of steel frames, so the the outer cladding was just a cladding. There was no it wasn't a, a um, it wasn't a construction actually. Um, the tiles they were just um, a cladding. So. So, so the steel frames, uh, we continued uh, also to be able to use the existing frames as they were. 
and but then the rest is uh, is kind of um, lightweight timber construction. Based on that building and this kind of question, have you had this question before? Are other folks trying to you to build off of this demonstration project of thinking about new types of thatch roofs and contemporary buildings? Well, there's, there's I mean, the the thatchers in Denmark, which is only like about forty people, um, they were really uh, happy with this building because, and they were they were so great. They they worked very sort of. They, they really wanted to help us with the experiment, uh, and they, in the end, uh, the, the company that won the bid had to take all the other thatchers in because otherwise, the, you know, it's quite a big building. Um, as, so after this, uh, there has been kind of a small rise in thatching uh, modern buildings because usually it was, you know, it's very sort of traditional, old-fashioned, um, not part of an abstract way of thinking. Yeah. Mm. Was that beautiful? Was that an answer? Yeah, yeah. No, I think I, I think it's interesting. I mean, it makes me think about places that might consider um, that kind of system that might not have that tradition. I mean, I think um, someone, you know, interrupt me if you have a question. I'm just going to keep going. <laughs> so, one one question based on the straw roof is, what about a place that has um, less tradition or less construction knowledge or there's a kind of need to build up a new history or um, hmm. build up a new identity of architecture. How do the, and we kind of live in this global world where materials are moving all across the planet and knowledge is moving all across the planet. And we as people are also kind of from many places. And how do you think of this kind of translation of practices like that in bringing them into other types of climates. Is there a kind of ethical or right and wrong, like climatic performance? Um, um, I don't think there's a right and wrong, but I think there's, uh, you, you need to be extremely thorough to understand your, your building techniques and your materials. I, you know, uh, I guess what is absolutely crazy is bringing you know, modernism in, into the desert, you know, with glass uh, and steel buildings and and cooling them down, you know, uh, it's, it's in a way there's a there's a kind of common sense I think in using building techniques um, that has to relate somehow climatically and um, so no right and wrong, but I think there's there's a thorough investigation into materials and and of course the thatching, um, I mean uh, using reeds uh, is really there's a lot of knowledge in this. Um, you, know, you can't cut the reeds, for example, because the capillar effect will actually suck water into the reeds if you do. You know, there, there, there are different things that you need to be very certain of, um, which doesn't have to do necessarily with tradition, or, but it has to do with knowledge, I think, yeah. You know. Wisdom. Mm. Um, questions? Oh, great, Eric, please. Um, thank you, Dorta, for this amazing lecture. Um, so much of your work has to do with a kind of immersive quality uh, within the landscape and uh, in the representation also kind of really um, emphasizes that. And I remember your Cornell students also, they somehow uh, you know, were inspired by that too. But what about the conversion? I mean, there's so much technical knowledge that goes into your work. So many uh, detours and if inefficiencies we've heard about. Uh, arguments probably that we're never going to hear about, you know, sitting down with a building uh, inspector and convincing them that the thatch roof will work, or the client that the roof will work. Um, and But in the presentation of your work, we see the kind of the finished product, <coughs> or, or very elegant, simple diagrams that are probably, I mean, I'm not sure if these are the ones you use to convince people. Um, can you give us a little hint, uh, some glimpse of the back of the house? Like, what happens at Dorta Mandrup? that you, know, you didn't show us today, some aspect of like the struggle. Um, mm, because otherwise yeah. it just looks like yeah. perfect tennis. <laughs> yeah, it's a, uh, <laughs> it's a, yeah, we lose a lot of competitions and we also, um, we also lost a lot of projects that, you know, that we won and then, it, 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 you know, so I think there's, um, um, I think that's probably the worst about being an architect is everything, all, all the, 
all the good ideas that you can't convince anybody on on doing. Um, but I I I I no, actually um, I think it's a lot of struggle. I think we uh, we spend a lot of time struggling and and um, and the success rate of you know just going there to get stuff. I mean, where stuff is actually realized is not that high. You know, <laughs> I mean, it takes uh, it takes a lot of um, failures. We have you know we have this uh, we have this shelf in the office. Uh, uh, with all the the failed projects that you, you know they're up for sale, like you can get them for ten percent or twenty percent. <laughs> no, I, 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 there's enormous amount of projects that are not uh, hasn't been realized, and and um, my my question is actually specifically about these projects. No. like the moment, you know, what did you show the clients at the beginning? Oh, how, how do you okay? How do you get there? You know, how do you get there? Yeah. Um, um, being very stubborn, I guess. Yeah. Um, no, I, I think that the. Uh, it, I mean, you need a good client uh, to. Um, you need a client where you have, uh, I guess, uh, chemistry. I think with these two foundations, or with these two buildings that we actually did for this foundation, uh, Raldania, or with those, as, you know, they are very active uh, investors, uh, very active. Um, you know, doing the competitions, being part of competitions, actually being a client, uh, and and there's another foundation in, in in Denmark that we that has other ideals, I guess, that we we can never win a competition with them. I mean, there's also it also has to do with them with common goals, I guess, and um, so I think you in the end, I think you know, choosing the right client, if if that was possible to to choose your clients. But at least you can choose who you don't want to work with. So you don't spend so much energy um, that is wasted anyway. So in, in the end, the client is all. I think it's everything. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've, I've had really bad clients too. So. <laughs> so. And you can, I mean, you could never, you can never realize anything with a really bad client. Thank you for the lecture. Um, and it was really interesting to see the very first project where you talked about a very um, challenging condition of bringing all these materials to a site that doesn't have things available. And then you ended with a project that sort of showed the ruins of an existing stoic uh, structure. So I'm curious if there has been sort of a shift in how you practice, um, especially in the context of sustainability. You're always giving back the land that you've sort of built on um, and you have these very complex assemblies of um, buildings, but do you ever think about in the design process how these things might eventually get deconstructed? Because I feel like mm. in the practice, we really think in the sense of constructing and we try to think about the negation of the building's uh, carbon footprint or whatnot mm. while it lives, but we're starting to see a lot of these buildings sort of reach the end of their lifetime. So when you design these new projects, how do you um, approach that? concept of sort of inevitability um, in the built world. I, yeah, the, the idea of buildings being built to be um, deconstructed again is, is, a, is a kind of fairly new thought, I think, um, um, sort of in general. Um, and we haven't, we haven't been working very much on that. I mean, but we work very much about, with the flexibility of a building being um, flexible enough to be used for different things in the future. You know, there's a, this kind of idea that, you know, the old factory buildings that you see getting transformed and reused again and again uh, is because they have a really, really simple construction, uh, large spans, uh, lots of ceiling height, and, you know, making these kind of um, general spaces that you could, you could use for almost anything, I mean, and enough daylight and so forth. So I think there's a, I think there's a, I think we are much more um, preoccupied with uh, flexibility, sort of future use flexibility, um, and how not to create spaces that are too uh, defined or programmed or 
built for a specific purpose, but it has the possibility to, to be transformed into something else. Um, but I, I do agree that the, um, the, the building for disassembly is, um, is also a knowledge that um, is interesting, I think, and, and it's an interesting thought. But I think it's much more important to me to build uh, sustainably, I mean, to, to actually transform if you can, you know, what's there, um, and uh, to, to build f uh, in a way so you have a flexible building that can be used for many things in the future. And of course, to use sustainable materials and, 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 uh, and energy consumption and, and so forth. But, and it's not just to make it, you know, more sustainable than yesterday. I think we have to be as radical as possible now because it's just um, it's just really really urgent mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. great question are there any other questions yeah. hi um, thank you for your lecture it was amazing um, my question is about your kind of engagement with the topography and the ground plane and like the ground surface. And you showed the project in Greenland where it's elevated at points, but then the project in Norway where it's actually directly engaging with it. And um, I was kind of struck by the images in the Greenland project of like the before and after of the site with before it was super like rich in, in plant life and afterward, I mean, it will come back, mm. but there was definitely like a lot of dirt and debris. And I'm just curious because I know that obviously there are a lot of issues that happen when the architect passes things mm. off to the contracting team um, and the builders. But I'm just curious, like what, what, how you reconcile like your design mm. with the actual construction and the impact of it on the ground and then... Yeah, any, any thoughts about that? Because mm. I feel like that's something I think about a lot is like this, this issue that construction by its very nature kind of tears things up. So just mm. curious to learn more. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, we, I, I guess, you know, using as, as little machinery as, as possible, uh, blasting as little as possible, I mean, all, all of these considerations was really part of the planning of the building site. And, and it is true that when you see the first pictures right after the, the building site was kind of, you know, closed down and the building was open, looks uh, really, uh, you know, um, um, like an explosion has been there almost. But it's also because the, the time of the year, I mean, it when you go to Greenland in the summertime, you have this, it's called um, Arctic cotton. You know, you have these white uh, cotton fields almost uh, all over. And, and you know, so, so there's the changing of the year also. And hopefully, uh, you know, next year you'll have a, um, a much greener uh, site. But, but, but it is kind of devastating to, to, because, you know, it takes so much longer in the Arctic than anywhere else. Yeah. Uh, you, 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 yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other final questions? That's a great question. I mean, I think that we're ready to um, say goodnight, but I wanted to just thank you so much for sharing your practice with us and for sharing the evening. So thank you, Dorothy. Thank you, and, and good luck with your finals. <laughs>